Before we get uh, started, I want to tell you a story. Uh, a story was told. There was once a young farmer who purchased two fields. Purchased two fields. And upon inspection of his new, his new purchase, he immediately fell in love with the first field. It had grand views. It was beautiful. Rolling hills. The sun broke over the horizon every single morning and just lit up this gorgeous field. It was also very easy to access. It was right off the road, and the soil was very sandy, so it was very easy to work and very easy to till. The second field, however, was a much more difficult field to get to. It was, it was tucked back in the woods, no grand views. It was surrounded by trees on every side. The soil was very hard and very deep and dark, but very hard to work. And so as the spring came, he decided to spend most of his time planting in the first field, the field that was beautiful to look at and that was easy to till the soil. Well, as the spring and, and summer progressed from a distance, he noticed his field was, was thriving, or at least he thought. But as fall approached upon closer inspection, his field was full of weeds. You see, the sandy soil couldn't produce a good crop. And so... Panicked, he rushed to the second field, which he spent very, very little time tilling and preparing. And yet he found when he got there, the crop he did plant was producing 70, even 100 fold of what he had planted. And so that farmer learned a very valuable lesson his first year of farming. You see, no matter how pretty the landscape, if the soil is bad, the crop will be awesome. And so from there on, he dedicated his time to working in the second field. The, sealed, the field that was more difficult, yet the soil was rich and produced a good crop. We'll get to more of this story in a moment. We'll kind of do a full circle with that story, but keep that in mind. Brothers and sisters, if the soil be bad, the crop will also be bad. There's no amount of tilling you can do to make the soil produce good crop. So with that in mind, let's look at James 1, verses 9 through 11. And you might be wondering, well, what does that story have to do with what we're going to read today? I promise it will make sense in about 45 minutes. <laughs> Reading James 1, verse 9. But let the brother of humble circumstances glory in his high position. Verse 10, and let the rich man glory in his humiliation, because like, the, because like flowering grass, he will pass away. Excuse me. Because like flowering grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with a scorching wind and withers the grass, and its flowers fall off, and the beauty of its appearance is destroyed. So too the rich man in the midst of his pursuits will fade away. Now, at first glance, this section of verses may seem as if James is kind of beginning a whole new topic, doesn't it? I mean, from the beginning of James, we've looked at what? Uh, we are called to be servants of the Most High God. And how do we serve God? We serve Him in humility and with great faith, always trusting our Lord through everything. And then we get to, to verse 9, and it says, talks about, start, talks about rich and poor and comparing and contrasting them. It's almost as if James had some type of, uh, I don't know, uh, problems focusing when he was writing. He's writing about, you know, uh, faith and, and servitude and, and humiliation before the Lord. And then he just starts talking about rich and poor people. And um, it might sound like James is just suffering from maybe compulsive disorder. I don't know, just jumping from topic to topic. Uh, because here we have this seeming contrast of a rich man and a poor man. And it may even at first glance look, at it, look like a contrast of their spiritual standing before God. It's kind of like James is speaking well of the poor at the expense of the rich. When we look at this, it says, But let the brother of humble circumstances glory in his high position, and let the rich man glory in his humiliation. But as we examine these verses more closely, I think you'll see that this isn't what James is doing here at all. This isn't what he's doing at all. Actually, he hasn't left the idea of either temptation and suffering and trials. He hasn't left the topic of humility or faith in our Lord. And he absolutely hasn't left the topic of servitude, which is how this book starts, right? James, a servant of the Lord and our Lord Jesus Christ. 
So actually in these verses, James gives us for the first time in this epistle, to kind of give you some context of what he's doing here, he's giving us a specific context, a specific uh, situation or circumstance in life where faith, humiliation, and keeping joy and focus in your trial is important. And James will do this throughout the entire book. He will bring up certain circumstances of life, certain behaviors in life, or maybe positions in life, and where all these things must be the overriding truth that guides us. Whether you are rich or you are poor, faith in God, humiliation before the Lord, serving the Lord remains the constant focus and disposition of the Christian. And that's what James is doing here for us. You see, there are unique trials and temptations that present themselves to both the rich and the poor in this life, both those in a high position and those in a low position. And this morning, we are going to examine a few of those temptations that each of those people will face. In addition, James isn't even contrasting the spiritual uh, differences between the rich and the poor. At first glance, it may seem that our text is making the point that maybe the poor are in a better position before the Lord, or maybe in a better position to be humble before the Lord. But I don't believe that's the case at all. I believe that what the Word of God is actually doing here is making a spiritual comparison between the two, showing us just how similar a rich person, a poor person, is spiritually to God, just how similar someone in a high position or someone in a low position is to one another. You see, no matter the circumstances of life, rich, poor, high position, low position, God's Word is pointing out that the thing that matters most, the only thing of importance, is that a Christian must possess a humble disposition before our Lord, right? The brother of humble, remember, and that word's very important, he starts it out with the brother of humble. Now, a brother is, in this context, in the Greek word, not your, your flesh brother, your blood brother. This is talking about a Christian brother. So we're, we're, James is writing to Christians, right? And he says, the brother of what? Humble circumstances needs to glory. And then he goes on and he says the rich must also glory, but what, in, but what is he to glory in? His humiliation, his humbleness. So there's a comparison here that both the rich and the poor need to be humble. And I'll make this clear even more as we go along. You see, James knows that he's writing to a group of Christians, Christian Jews specifically, that are scattered throughout the land. And this epistle will find its hand into the rich and the poor alike. And the poor were, in James' day, just as they are in our day, often treated very poorly, often treated as second-class citizens with very little dignity. And the rich were also treated with much honor and dignity. So remember, Christianity is still in its infancy. So when this is written, the Holy Spirit is using James to kind of set the guidelines or the governances of Christian behavior and how we treat each other, regardless of our social position. Verse 9 and 10 say, But the brother of humble circumstances is to glory in his high position, and the rich man is to glory in his humiliation. So what have we learned so far in the book of James, right? Is it the proud and the arrogant, the haughty man who is in good standing with the Lord, who finds favor with the Lord, who has a reason to rejoice in his good standing with God? Of course not. That's silly. We know that that's not true. It is the one who is humble before the Lord, who considers himself to be a servant of God, who is then lifted up. Actually, Jesus himself says that in Luke 14, 11. Luke 14, 11 says, For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled by God, and all those who humble themselves will be exalted. Now, now Jesus here is specifically talking not just about the consequences of proud, arrogant living in this life, but also on the day of judgment. If we go through our life rejecting Christ, living a life apart from Christ with a, with a haughty attitude that I don't need God. God will humble you on the day of judgment. But if you humble yourselves in this life and offer yourselves to the Lord as a humble servant of him, then he will exalt you on the day of judgment. So the one who considers himself low has much reason to rejoice in the Lord, or as James put it, puts it to glory in his high position. 
You see, the poor brother has much to rejoice in because he is a humble servant of Christ. And that's what James is making the point here. He's not making a point that because you are poor in this life, you have a reason to rejoice. James is making the point that because you are humble before the Lord, you have reason to rejoice. And likewise, the rich man has the same reason to rejoice. Not that he's rich, but that he's a humble servant of the Lord. So I think it's actually a comparison here. James is comparing and saying, listen, it doesn't matter what position in this life you're in, a low position, high position, rich or poor, the only reason we have to exalt, uh, uh, the only reason we have to rejoice is because of who we are as servants of Christ. So I hope that makes, I make that, uh, made that clear enough for you. Now, we'll get back to this in a moment, but there's something that we need to address very quickly before we go any further. So if the rich man and the poor man, as long as they are humble before God, have the same position before God, that is the, that probably the most important thing we need to understand. But this life, whether you are rich or poor, will offer you very different trappings to fall into, very different temptations. Remember, we talked about temptations at the beginning of James. Satan will use every circumstance of your life to tempt you, and he will likewise use your rich or high position, your, your wealth or your high position, or your lack of wealth in your low position to tempt you as well. And so verse 9 makes the point to remind those who are in a low position to rejoice. But why would it remind somebody who is in a low position to rejoice? The reason James is reminding them to rejoice is because it's very easy for someone in a low position to lose their sense of joy in this life. Especially when you look in this culture we live in, right? I mean, we live in such a wealthy, prosperous culture. And it is very easy, should we not consider ourselves a humble servant of Christ first, to look at all the things we want and yet don't have. Materialism is rampant in our society. And prosperity is everywhere. This is the richest nation in the history of the world. Even the poorest among us are rich in world standard, in the, in the, in, compared to the rest of the world. Uh, I, I think I've shared this stat before, but if, uh, but if you make uh, uh, even the poorest, I won't put a number on, even the poorest in this culture have more wealth than 93% of the rest of the world the poorest in this culture. If you, have a, if, you, if you don't live in a home that has a dirt floor, you are better off than 89% of the population of the world. We are far richer than we think we are, even the poorest among us. But you see, the desire and temptation to grow discontent with our humble income or maybe our humble position in this life is very strong, very strong. And I think that's why James reminds them, brother of humble circumstances, you gotta look past that stuff. Remember to rejoice. Rejoice in your exaltation, who you are before the Lord. And so I want to examine just for a moment for us this morning those who are in a humble position, the trappings that you may face trappings you may face. Now this will be up on the screen and we'll kind of go through three very quickly. Should be the next slide, I think. Uh, keep going. That was where we went through that one. Okay, so the trappings of the poor. So what are some unique trials that face the humble those of humble position or those who have a low income? The first is this, covetousness and or jealousy, right? What is more dangerous in this life than a discontent, jealous, and covetous heart? It's the 10th commandment, right? Thou shalt not covet. And yet those who are in a humble situation or maybe have a low income, it is very easy for them to fall into a covet, uh, covetous uh, uh, dispensation or uh, uh, dispension. According to James, um, we must be very, very careful, very careful to protect ourselves from becoming Covetous. James 3.16, which we won't get to for a while now, says, For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, so he revisits the same topic later in this book, where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. So James even says the gateway to vile, wicked behavior in your life is a covetous or jealous heart. Every vile practice can be Trace back to a covetous heart. Nothing will cause soul rot in your life faster than if you are consumed 
with want, with a covetous heart. Proverbs 14.30, and you can write this down, I don't have it on the screen, but Proverbs 14.30 says, a tranquil heart gives life to the flesh. So a heart that is at peace, content, what will it do? It will give life to your flesh. But listen, but envy makes the bones rot. Envy makes the bones rot. That's Proverbs 14.30. And the man or woman of humble position in this life is particu particularly susceptible to falling prey to the temptation of jealousy and covetousness. And I'll tell you something, covetousness will always lead to brokenness in your life. Always lead to brokenness. There is no hope for that path. Broken human relationships with friends, children, parents, bosses, church leaders, and the list goes on. But ultimately, it will bring corruption to re your relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm going to tell you something this morning that you may have figured out. You may already have this figured out, but I'm going to blow your minds. Life is not fair nor was it intended to be. Life is not equal. What others have, you are not promised. And your life is not for your personal gain. Remember, we're focusing on the servitude of the Christian. That's what James is about, serving the Lord. Does a servant put more, uh, put a premium on their own gain or the gain of the one they're serving? The gain of the one they're serving, of course. Life is not fair, it is not equal, and it is not for your personal gain, church. I know this culture wants to tell you different. This culture wants to tell you you deserve everything. You have rights in everything imaginable. That is a load of garbage. And you know what? Satan has used that to corrupt generations in this culture. Generations of people. I mean, look at the, even the young culture, the millennial culture, which I am uh, unfortunately right on the cusp. I am a millennial by a year. We have been so spoiled in our upbringings that we almost demand we be treated a certain way. And when we don't get it, you can read the news. Look on college campuses. It's the end of the world when we don't get what we think we deserve. You see, the idea that life is supposed to be fair, that you deserve everything, that you have all these rights, is a lie designed by Satan to make you become bitter, resentful, and jealous of what other people have. Covetousness is everywhere, church, and we all have to deal with it at some level. Even the rich have to deal with it at some level. But I believe the poor have to deal with it in an even greater, as an even greater temptation. We all have to deal with it. We all are tempted to covet. We want, want, and want. I think it's human nature, the sinful part of our human nature, to want and want and want more, right? New, new car, home, clothes, technology, we covet those things sometimes. Our neighbor's wife or husband, those things are coveted, right? I, I, don't, I didn't look up the exact uh, stat this week, but adultery is rampant in this society. Fornication and divorce, rampant. We covet other people's wives or husbands. We might covet someone's job or recognition in a company or their position or title in this life. Even in the church, there's, it's, it's no different. Uh, churches can fall prey to covet the growth of one church over another or maybe the perception of one church in the community over another. You can covet those things too. There is no end to the opportunities for you to covet church, and that is why we must be on guard. That is why I believe James says, hey, brother of humble circumstance, forget about that stuff. Don't focus on that. Rather, rejoice in who you are in Christ. Rejoice that Christ has exalted you. Rejoice that you have found salvation. We must be on guard, church, because in the end, covetousness will destroy you and lead to bitterness, angry, resent, anger, resentment, and brokenness in your life and in your relationship with God. That's why, uh, that's why the book of 1 Timothy says godliness with contentment is what? Great gain. Godliness with contentment. Contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, right? 
and we can bring nothing out of it. The same concept that James discusses here in verse 11, right? All of your pursuits, church, I don't care if you're rich or you're poor, all of them will fade away and be meaningless, literally meaningless, your worldly pursuits on the day of judgment. They will mean nothing. And yet how many of us pour the majority of our life into those meaningless pursuits? More on that later. The second trap that those of humble position or maybe of low income face is a transgression of another of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not steal. Theft is the next one. Theft is the next one. Proverbs 39, Agar writes this, If I am poor, I might steal and profane the name of my God. Theft. Covetousness, I believe, in the heart of uh, a man or woman will always lead to theft of some sort. Always lead to theft of some sort. Now, theft doesn't need a lot of explanation. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, church, but it's not just going to the store and taking something, shoplifting, right? We steal from uh, maybe our parents, our friends. We fudge the numbers on our taxes. We don't fill out our medical report uh, correctly in order to find some gain that way. We forge documents. There are hundreds of ways to steal, church, thousands of ways to steal. Identity theft is a huge thing nowadays. Credit card theft, the list goes on. You see, when we covet, when we covet and transgress the law of God, we will always transgress this law as well. Law as well. So theft is the second temptation of those who are in low position. And I want you to think about it's not just going shoplifting at Meyer. Theft takes on many, many forms. Stealing time from your boss at work or several other things. That's the second trap. The third trap, the third trap, which I think is perhaps maybe, uh, I, it's hard to classify them, but perhaps the most um, dangerous of the three, if I can say that, although the other three I understand are very dangerous. The third temptation is a heart of ungratefulness. Heart of ungratefulness. Now, I believe a covetous heart, a heart that leads to theft in this life, will all, always lead to ungratefulness in this life, too. I cannot even begin to, to understand how anybody in this country could be ungrateful, and yet we have millions of ungrateful people in this country. And I'm going to talk even more so ungratefulness towards God as the Christian. But just in this country, right? Just in this country alone. The poorest in this country do not go without food. The poorest in this country have a place to live. The poorest in this country are, can, can, can attain some type of income from the government. The poorest in this country. And yet, ungratefulness fills the hearts of so many. So many. 2 Timothy 3, 2 says this, for men will be lovers of self. And, Tim, and, and, and Paul is writing on those men of the last day, the people of the last day. What will become of them? Well, Paul writes, they will be lovers of self, right? How, how, do, how much do we talk about self-love in the society, right? The constant. I saw this week on the uh, cover of some magazine, uh, they, they, they put a morbidly obese woman on the cover of this fashion magazine and said, you must accept how she is and say she's beautiful and say she's healthy and all these things, right? That's baloney. That is baloney. We, we will be lovers of self even when our, our, our behavior is completely destructive to our bodies, whether that is obesity, whether that is homosexuality, whether that is abortion. This culture calls everything that is evil and wrong good. So, for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money. I don't have to explain that in this culture. Lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, reviler, revilers, disobedient to parents, and that what, then what does Paul write? And ungrateful. Those in the last day will be, all these things will come, and Paul ends with, they will be ungrateful and therefore unholy before God. Ultimately, all the temptations in life, especially as we're talking about the trappings of those who are in a low position in this life, all of them will lead to a life of ungratefulness. Even the things you have won't be enough for you. And an ungrateful life is not a life, church, that is pleasing to the Lord in any way, shape, or form. An ungrateful servant, if you are a Christian, an ungrateful servant 
as an unfaithful servant. When you refuse to acknowledge God's goodness in everything, his faithfulness, his mercy, and his provision in your life, that ties right back to what James wrote last week. You will receive nothing from the Lord, nor should you expect to. Nor should you expect to. Think about that. If we are in a constant state of want and covetousness, an ungrateful heart, what we're doing is we're, we are refusing to acknowledge God's goodness, his faithfulness, his care, his mercy towards us. How offensive is that to a God who has given all so that we might be saved? And so those are just three trappings of those in a humble position or those in a poor position this life. And we're going to go back to this a little bit later. But I want you to begin to think of your own heart. How grateful are you really for your, your position in life? See, God doesn't promise you health, wealth, love, joy, peace, and happiness. God promises you salvation through Christ Jesus. And your lot in life, your temptation and your trial in life might be very great indeed. It might be that you're in a low position your entire life. But God wants you to get off of focusing on your circumstances. That's what James, the whole entire book, is about. Much of it is about. It's about living a life of faith through difficult circumstances. Quit focusing on your circumstances and your desire and your want. And start focusing on what you do have in Christ Jesus. That is what James is pointing us to. So with that, let's look at verse 10. And the rich man is to glory in his humiliation. So again, we have this concept that the word of God is reminding the rich man that their circumstances aren't what's important either. If you are wealthy this morning, if you had a high, have a high position in your work or just in life in general, James is trying to get you to look past that because that will lead to some very serious trappings of sin as well. Let's look at a few of those right now. The first trapping of sin that the rich or the wealthy or those in high position face is the trap of pride and arrogance. Pride and arrogance. Should be right there, and it is. Proverbs 11.2 says this, When pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with humility comes wisdom. We've learned that, of course, just from the book of James. When we are humble before the Lord, we ask in faith, God gives us wisdom. Well, Proverbs says the same thing. When pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with humility comes wisdom. And who is more disgraced due to their pride than King Nebuchadnezzar? Remember the king of Babylon, the book of Daniel? What did God do to bring King Nebuchadnezzar low? Probably the most proud man on earth, and by human standards, rightfully so, right? He was the king of the most powerful empire probably to ever exist in this world, the Babylonian Empire. What did God do to King Nebuchadnezzar to bring him low? He made him eat grass of the field, lose his mind on his hands and knees like the ox. King Nebuchadnezzar fell hard because he refused refused to humble himself before the Lord. Today, the rich face the same temptations that King Nebuchadnezzar faced. Wealth, position of influence, those things have the way of seizing hold of the affections of, a heart, of the heart of a man or woman like very few things are capable of. Wealth can seize the heart Influence can seize the heart and cause it to become proud and arrogant and boast not in Christ, but in self. Lovers of self, remember? Uh, 2 Timothy, and one of the things that we will be is lovers of self. Everything that we do, we will love ourselves. You see, oftentimes, those who are in a high position or of high wealth think of themselves as more important, maybe more capable, maybe more worthy of others around you, than others around you. Pride causes a man to become insolent, haughty, and entitled. What is wrong with this culture today? Well, part of the problem is that we are wealthy, unlike any culture in the history of the world. We have been told our whole lives that we deserve everything, and when we don't get it, we throw a fit. Look at the condition of the youth in, in our culture today, which I already pointed out. They are insolent. They are proud, but not even just them. 
The rich man, whether he is a hundred or ten, can fall prey to pride and arrogance, demanding everything be given to them. And of course, pride is a very, very effective trap of Satan. So if you find yourself this morning uh, well-to-do, well-off, pride and arrogance is something that you must guard your heart against. Second is this. Wealth affords a limitless opportunity to, to find sin and to, and to engage in sin or engage in worldly treasures. Now, what I mean by this is when money is no object in your life, all form of sin and lustful living, living become available to you. All forms. The sky is the limit. This world offers you more opportunity to sin than you would ever need. And when we have a, 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 an excess of wealth, that the person who is not careful to guard their heart will find that they can purchase, so to speak, any sin that is available. But more than this, riches have a way of distracting even the most committed follower of Christ from engaging in kingdom work and using their wealth instead for worldly lusts. Worldly lusts. In the early church of Acts, those who were rich, what did they do? They sold everything. And who did they give it to? The Lord, one another, the work of the church, right? That's what the rich did in, in, in the church in the book of Acts, right? What do the rich do in this culture in the church? Usually give very little to the church in comparison to the wealth they have, very often. I don't know what percentage that is per person, but it is usually... The rich, even the rich Christian, usually gives out of their wealth or because of their wealth. They do not give sacrificially. And that is another opportunity that wealth causes us to fall into. This idea that worldly things have become more important than heavenly treasures, right? And I want to be clear this morning. Not all things are inherently evil. And I'm not saying you can't spend your money on something uh, for your enjoyment. That's not, uh, that's not even a biblical concept. Abraham was wealthy beyond belief. So I'm not saying that God doesn't want you to be wealthy. What I am uh, saying and what I believe James is telling us is be on your guard because you will, if you are rich, be tempted to spend most of that money on you, on yourself, and on worldly treasures and lusts. I do believe all things, though, all things uh, of this world anyway, have the capacity to be evil, right? Wealth affords you the resources to make anything more important than God. Anything. It could be travel, hunting, your job, investments, a collection of some sort. There are hundreds of things that those who are rich could make more important than serving their Lord. And that's what James is trying to remind you of. If you are rich, forget about that stuff. Remember that to God, you are just a humble servant. That is what you are. Use then your riches as a servant of God for your Lord. That's the second trap. The third trap that the rich or those in high position can fall into is that they can lose their sense of reliance upon God. And this is perhaps the most rampant in our society. Like I said, the, the poorest in America are richer than 93% of the world's population. So even if you are the poorest in this culture, remember you are rich compared to the rest of the world. Filthy rich compared to most of the rest of the world. And that causes us to lose our reliance upon God. We don't rely on God anymore. We rely on our bank account. We rely on how much money we have saved. We rely on our inheritance. We rely on our nice home, our nice vehicle, our everything we have becomes what we rely on. And if you want to test yourself this morning, this might be hard to do for just one moment to see if maybe you have your uh, priorities out of line, imagine that every single worldly possession you have were gone today. How would you handle that? Now, I'm not saying you wouldn't be sad or it wouldn't be a blow to you, but I think you'd find out real quick what you were relying on if it was gone, if that wealth was gone today. And I believe in this country, probably most of us rely far more on our wealth than we do on the Lord. Far on more on our ability to purchase our own things, our own needs, than we do on the Lord. We've lost our ability to trust in Him. 
because money has taken the place of that. After Paul Washer, uh, many of you know Paul Washer, he's an evangelist. After he returned home from Peru in the early 1990s, he was speaking at a church and he was talking about just his mission trips. And, and he said this, he said, I, I got up every morning and I shared the gospel all day long. That's all I did. I went from town to town I had no idea where my food was coming from that day. I had no idea where I would sleep that night. I just went into each town and trusted the Lord that he would provide those things. In addition to that, there was a war going on in Peru at this time, a civil war, infighting, and many people were being killed. He said he didn't even know if he'd survive that day, let alone find his food and, 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 and shelter and drink and all those things. His focus was on one thing. It was on the gospel. And after he spoke, a woman said to him, uh, Mr. Washer, that must have been so incredibly difficult. So difficult. And Paul Washer said to her, her and the whole, people, whole congregation gathered, he said, no, no, it was easy. You in America have it difficult. See, I had, I had to rely on God for everything, which is what we are commanded to do. I had to. I had no other choice. In America, your money is what you rely on. It was easy for me because I had no other choice. It's hard for you because you have other choices. We rely on our money, our wealth, or our position far more often than we ought to. You see, church, riches have a way of splitting our allegiances and hopes, don't they? They can split our allegiances. We say we trust in God and place our hope in Him, but many of us probably put more hope in our bank accounts than we do the Lord. I don't know if this describes you or not. But like I said, to the best of your ability, imagine that everything you have was gone tomorrow. Would that destroy your hope? Would that destroy your trust? Would that destroy your disposition? and demeanor before God. I believe probably to many of us, perhaps most of us, it, it would. We need to test ourselves, church. So what does all this have to do with what James is discussing, right? We talked about a field, a couple fields at the beginning. We talked about the trappings of uh, the rich and the poor. Well, I want to say this. God is reminding us today that your circumstances of life ought not to have such a hold on you. The circumstances of this life ought not to define you. And yet, to both the rich and the poor, to many of us, especially in this culture, I believe those things have defined us. You see, the, the, the Jews in James' time weren't much different than us in this time. This was a very prosperous time in the world, in the Middle East, in Ro the Roman Empire. It was very prosperous. There were those who were poor, sure. Jesus said that. You will always have the poor among you. Those people became very easy for them to covet what they didn't have. The rich became very easy for them to demand respect and dignity. Remember what does Paul write in 1 Corinthians? You know, don't give the person of, that, that is wealthy the better seat in the church. That happened. That was going on. It was going on. James wants to remind us that whether you are poor today, whether you are rich today, there's a coming, there's coming a day, those things will fade away. They won't matter. They will have no importance whatsoever to your eternity. As the grass withers and the flowers fall, James says, there will come a day when it's over with. Your life is like chaff blown by the wind. Don't dwell on your position in this life, church. Don't dwell on who you are, who you think you are. Unless that thing be that you are a servant of Christ, rich or poor, right? It is easy to become distracted with wealth or a lack of wealth, just as easily. Rather, we ought to be God's humble servants first. And I want to kind of change our minds a little bit, right? We need to focus on our heavenly position, not our earthly position, our heavenly circumstance, not our earthly circumstances. Because our health, our wealth, our position are here today and they will be gone tomorrow. End of story. And yet, many of us spend our entire lives, endeavor our entire lives to build up money, possession, wealth. Even the poor among us. 
Whether you are rich or poor this morning, your condition before God will not be judged on that. James is reminding us of that. But rather on your attitudes, your convictions, your faith, your humility as a servant before the Lord Jesus Christ. And ultimately, how you deal with the temptations and trials in this life. You see, James has not left the topic of humility and faith at all in these verses, even though at first glance it may seem like it. He is simply putting a context to how we are to live in humility in spite of our outward circumstances. And like I said, he will do this not with just wealth and, and poverty. He will do this with other things as well. Outward circumstances. He's giving us just two examples of the circumstance that you could find yourself in this morning. Just two of many but reminding us that those circumstances don't determine our spiritual health. Actually, they ought to have nothing to do with it. If you are poor, of humble circumstances, if this world thinks little of you, if you are not held in esteem by men, if you lack the wisdom of men, if you are in humble societal rank, if those things describe your circumstances this morning, what the Lord wants to remind you of is those things are of little consequence. Focus on and rejoice in who you are in Christ. That is what is important. That is what matters. They have no merit to your true standing before God. Quit listening to this world in this culture that tells you if you have little that you're somehow lesser. Quit listening to the lies of Satan that say if you have little, you somehow deserve more. And the same holds true if you are rich in worldly things or in high position. Your riches are not a reason to boast, and if they are, shame on you. That's what James is telling you and telling us. That's why James is reminding you your riches are fading away. They're, they're going to be gone. You're going to stand before God one day, and all those riches you had on earth are just going to be burned up. And the only thing you're going to have to offer him is how you served him and the things you did for work in his kingdom. It's the only thing that's going to matter. We have such a hard time getting that through our heads, though, because we are so temporal. We look at the, con the situations of this life, the circumstances of this life, and we elevate those above who we really are in Christ. We cannot do that. If you are wealthy this morning, guess what? According to God, you are still just one thing, a servant, his servant, period. If you think you are more than that, then you're gravely mistaken. You are a servant of God. And you know what? As a servant of God, use that wealth for his glory. And yet finally, church, we need to understand one thing. Rich or poor, you are an heir if you are in Christ. If you are in Christ, that is big. Big, big disclaimer there. But if you, if you are in Christ this morning, rich or poor, you are an heir to the glories of heaven. You are an heir to the excellencies and the spoils of God's eternal care. That is what James is trying to tell us, to remember, to put our focus on. As servants, that is our end game. That is our end goal. And yet how many of us place these foolish, useless, worthless, worldly lusts ahead of that? And live in a way where the only thing that if someone were to look on the outside, the only thing that we care about is what we can get for ourselves here and now. Church, we have to put, look past this behavior. We live in a world that is dominated by materialism. We live in a country that, make, that takes materialism to an extreme, absolute extreme. And it's easy for us to get caught up in those worldly lusts. It just is. It just is. I'm going to say something, church. Uh, this morning, if you gave me a list and I had a piece of paper and I could write down all the things I wanted, whew, that would be a long list. It would be a long list. But God is reminding you and me this morning there's only one thing we need, church. There might be a lot of things you want, but there's only one thing that you need. We need faith in Christ and we need to live as humble servants. That's what we need, church. We have to have faith in our God and live as humble servants before him. Those things you think, those things you want are not needs in any way, shape, or form. Whether we have little or much, it will all perish, just as the grass withers and the flowers fall. We saw that this summer, right? We had a drought this summer. A lot of the grass withered in just a few weeks. That's what God's comparing our life to. 
in our pursuit of these things. Right? What, is a pro what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet lose the only thing that has value? His soul. Rich or poor this morning, the temptations you face in each of those things can either destroy your faith in God if you focus on them or if you look past them and look to who you are in Christ and look to what God has promised you in Christ, an eternal heir to the throne of God's grace and mercy, his eternal care. Church, if we could just flip our minds on those things and focus on who we are in Christ versus what this world has to offer, I believe we'd be far more effective in our relationships, in our gospel sharing, in our work for God's people, for the church, how we treat, and James is going to deal with this later, the poor, the orphans, the widows in our society. We change a lot of things about our lives. All the glittering beauty of this life that distracts us from truly pursuing our Lord as a runner pursues the finish line will one day die along with our physical body. They're just going to be gone, and they're not going to matter. One day, everything that you have accomplished in this life that is not eternal, that is not kingdom work, will be of no value. Right? Which brings us full circle, brothers and sisters, back to those two fields we talked about at the beginning of the sermon. Which field are you plowing in, church? Which field are you spending your time plowing in? Are the majority of your pursuits temporal? Are you spending the majority of your time and money plowing in the field of worldly things? The field that is sandy soil that will produce no crop for you will produce no crop in this life and absolutely no crop in the life to come. Is that where you're spending the most of your time? I'll tell you one thing. It's easy to plow in that field, right? Just like the farmer who found it was easy to till the sand. It's easy to plow in that field. And you know what? That beautiful rolling field looks great from a distance. The world looks great from a distance, church. We want to jump right in. But plowing in that field will produce no eternal reward. It is a futile endeavor. The soil of worldly things is bad soil. There's nothing you can do to make that soil good. No amount of tilling that will do the trick. If you are plowing in poor soil this morning with the majority of your time, your efforts, your income, there's only one solution, church. It's quite simple to say. Whole other thing to do, right? Great preaching, hard living. If you're plowing in poor soil this morning, start plowing in a different field. Period. Be like the young farmer who realized his work was better off in the soil that produced good crop. Good, rich soil. The field of eternal reward is the most fertile soil in all the world, church. The work may be harder, but it will produce a hundredfold what you put in because God is blessing that work. Serve the Lord then, brothers and sisters, with humility. Trust in him with faith. Put no trust in your position in this world. Whether that's complaint and covetousness of a low position or that is pride and arrogance of a high position. James is telling us, let the rich man glory in his position in Christ. Let the poor man glory in his position in Christ. Whatever circumstance you find yourself in, you are the same before our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Trust in the Lord then. Trust in the Lord with the strongest and most sincere faith. Get out of the field that you don't belong in and get into God's field. Because one day all of us, well, I would say not even one day, right now I believe all of us must take an account of how we're using our time, how we're using our resources, the motivations, the attitudes of our heart. Is your, is, dis is your disposition before God, your attitude before God, one of a humble servant, or one of an ungrateful servant, or one of an arrogant servant, proud servant? We have to look at ourselves, church, because if you truly are a servant of God, then you need to look at your time as not your own. You need to look at your wealth or even your lack thereof as not your own. 
Whatever position you are in, God has you there and has work for you to do in that position with what he's given you. And I know this is easy to say and a whole other thing to actually live, but every one of us must take stock, church. Every one of us must take stock because every one of us will answer to the Lord and give an account. And all the work you are engaging in, and if it, if it is not kingdom work, as James writes, in the midst of your pursuit, they'll fade away. How are you using the Lord's time, church? Let's pray.